sometimes I find it looks, it has a weird configuration, but then when I take it out, it'll... Oh, I know what the problem is. I need to, um, it's already here, I think. It's this little gray icon. Yep, it doesn't want to show. There we go. All right. And, all right, so it is running to the black edge. Popped up. If you go to, sorry, if you go back to and um, click on displays, and then right here, we can do a little bit of scaling. Uh, mm -hmm. I would pick 1080p. That usually works well. We'll take a look. Mm -hmm. There we there go. go. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Is it? It looks good. Oh, well, I'll pull the, uh, I'm trying to get out of there for a second. Did you send it? Okay. All right, let's see if we'll pull it. I'll pull it up. Is it looking weird? Oh, okay. Um, now it's going to be under. Um, no, it hasn't come yet. There it is, okay. And then, and, and this, and you'd like me to so, yep, um, just add it? Yep, so if you download it as like a JPEG. Uh, no. download, save as a JPEG. Yeah. So save as or just save? Um, um, actually do it, export, not oh, as PDF. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, export. Yeah. And then um, PNG is fine too. Okay, and then I'll just put it on the desktop. Well, no, I can put it there. Actually, let me put it on desktop because it'll just be, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know what? Desktop can be a mess. So let's just put it. If you want to put it, you know what? Downloads. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in my keynote because oh. it'll be. I'm having. There's some little oh. issues are coming up. Let's see. I, hopefully it'll come up. I don't think you saved. I think it canceled. Did I yes. cancel? Yes. Okay. Oh <laughs> no, there it is. Oh. Okay. It's under my recent. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's fine. Okay. So then let's pull up this the lecture. So I have the lecture here. Yeah, I think that's probably. Okay. And then it's and the then end of the blank slide. I think the aspect looks good, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then, right. and then um, you want me to do like a background? Yeah. Okay. It's background. Oh. Room search. Yeah. Okay. This is the problem trying to find it. Um, Recents. Yeah. It'll be under recents. It should be. Oops. What did you call? Oh, what's the name of it? Um, I think it was. It had an odd. And it should just. You'd think it would put. Oh, there. I found it. There. Okay. Oh, I can just make it a... I'll just make it a... Perfect. Thank you Okay. So mm -hmm. You're welcome. So, that's how it... Okay, and then I do need to... I need to close something because I don't want things to come... Before we do that, I want to make sure that I close out of my email and it doesn't pop up all yeah. through the email. Okay. Okay, there. It should come up now.
There we go. Is that? We got it. Okay, great. Right. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Sounds good. All right. Are you just going to be at the podium for the most part anyways? Uh, yeah. I'll be. Yeah, I'll be. Yeah, I am going to be. Actually, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to move this over this way because I'm going to have my papers, and I'll need that, and then I'll be able to click that way. Okay. That works. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. Hey Dylan, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. So you have to leave, right? You have a class? Where's your class? It's like kind of across campus. So it's like, but I'm like, so it's really good. Oh, good. I saw Damon last night. Yeah, how was it? It was good. Make I work, and then I had a bunch of people. Where do you where do you work? Neutral side at the Teen Center. So what is that like? Um, it's like the Teen Center down in Ann Arbor. Oh, okay. Do you do writing? Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, good. Well, it's good. I'm so glad you were able to come. Well, in ten minutes, I think. Y'all have like a ten-minute period or thing or something. Hey, how are you? Yeah, Michigan Town. How are you doing? Hi, Kathleen. Good to see you. Glad to be here. So glad to be here. It was wonderful. That's what I was saying. It was. I didn't leave at six in the morning like I normally do. I left at like one. It was a direct flight. It was two and a half hours. I watched a movie about Mike. Oh, the guy who's on. Um, 60 minutes. Um, Mike Lair. No, Mike. Oh, Mike. Oh, it's no, another. Jim Lair. Yes, it's another Mike. But he was the main person <laughs> who was on the show. I could okay. see his voice, but I can't remember. I watched the, that documentary. I got in. The driver was there. Everything was great. We're, we're responsible for all of well, that. There you go. So it won't, it, no traffic. Yes. No traffic. <laughs> and I got to see my little cousin. I have two cousins that go to school here. Well, one just gra he graduated. That's who I was just talking to. That's Dylan right there. She's a, like, I, I thought she's right back there. Yeah, she's a, I think she's an English major. But she's a right, I don't know, she may end up becoming an English teacher. I don't know. And then her brother graduated, and I saw him last night. So that was cool. Yeah. I know. Well, I told, I said, I would, there's no way I would have come in this morning. Like, I, that would have, I would have been afraid that something would happen and I wouldn't get here. And then I couldn't go back tonight, so then I'll go back tonight. I always get extremely nervous. So Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot actually came, so I arrived two and a half hours before her talk. I was really nervous. But she probably does it a lot. You know, my thing is, I, I could, I don't think I would be nervous about me. Like, I don't think I'd be frazzled. The problem is I worry it's like a plane that, you know, that there would be a delay, especially coming to Michigan and it could be snowing and you don't know what it's going to be like. And I don't know. So. Kefralin. It's spelled like that. Your mic is live right now, so maybe we should turn that off. Oh, can you hear me? Do you see the, is there a thing? Or I could take it off. I don't know how to turn it on or off. <laughs> Can I take it off for you? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And then we'll put it back on. We are getting very distracted. I think we need to start a quick time because. Let's do that. Exactly. On. Okay.
Good afternoon. It is so lovely to see all of you. Um, I'm Simona Golden, and I direct the Teaching Works Streaming Seminar Series, and I am just filled with excitement about the evening ahead with you and with um, our incredible guest. Uh, so I want to welcome you to the second Teaching Works Streaming Seminar Series talk of this academic year that is focused, as most of you know, on the theme, Pivot Towards the Light, Challenges of Making Justice Integral. I think most of you also know that we were really deeply inspired by Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot's AERA 2017 Distinguished Lecture. So much so that we've designed the entire series around a number of the things that she said that day, now nearly three years ago. In particular, she entreated us. She said, rather than being consumed by the darkness, I want to pivot towards the light. I want to frame our continued and deepening work as a project of inspired creativity, a deep gesture of nuanced counterpoint. So we've really taken inspiration from Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot, and we've asked all of this year's speakers the following three questions. What we ask are the pressing problems and challenges of making justice integral. How can we name and how can we operationalize those problems? And what might be ways we can and should take action on these challenges so that we can make really meaningful headway? We pivot towards the light I would like to say, not in any kind of blind naivete, but instead with some curiosity and some conviction, asking, again as Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot asked, what is good here? With the knowledge that liberatory and transgressive work has been accomplished, it has been created, and it often can be found in spaces that have been vilified, spaces that have been pathologized by scholars and by policymakers. Pivot towards the light, then, is really a clarion call. It's an incitement to us to action, with the full knowledge that while systemic racism and inequality has been baked into the institution of schooling, that liberatory teaching is a possibility. And it is and it can be found across context. So we're committed to seeking that light, to drawing strength and inspiration from it, and to marshalling it in service of the good that can and must be constructed in partnership with educators, with scholars, and perhaps most importantly, with families and their communities. So we've invited, as you know, a, a series of really spectacular speakers to share with us what it is that keeps them up at night. That's actually a question we've yeah. asked them to tell us. Right. What keeps you up at night in the fight against racism and oppression? What do you think about what we should do right now and in each and every day following today to pivot towards the light? How can we act in solidarity while drawing from our greatest creativity and our imaginations, while drawing from the good? It is really exciting to welcome Dr. Kefferlin Brown as our second speaker of the series. We've long been admirers and have learned deeply from her ambitious scholarship. Dr. Brown's talk is, has a fantastic title, I'm Going to Let It Shine, The Continued Legacy and Promise of Centering Justice in Teaching and Curriculum. Those of you who've been here before know that we're going to safeguard um, a bunch of time at the end of uh, Dr. Brown's talk. So I'm going to ask you to keep track of the questions, your musings, your wonderings, so that um, when we get to the end of the talk, you can ask your questions of her and of each other. Um, if you're viewing online, if you're joining us online, and I know that actually many hundreds of you are, um, we want to hear your voices and to hear your thoughts and your questions as well. And you have a number of ways to get those to us. So you can tweet using our handle, TW Seminar, and you'll see some of us madly um, tapping out on our phones. It's not because we're buying something on Amazon, but instead mm -hmm. it's because we're tweeting what's happening here. So if you're not in the room, tweet your questions with the hashtag TW Seminar. You could also send us emails at twseminar at umich.edu. And I believe you could also use our Teaching Works Facebook page. Is that correct, Alyssa? Yes. Um, so we'll be live tweeting the seminar and we'll be sitting on the edges of our seats as we learn with you and um, with each other. And with that, I invite my dear colleague Deborah Ball up to introduce our speaker. 
Thank you, Simona. And good afternoon, everyone. I want to join Simona in welcoming all of you to the room and all of you who are watching remotely. We're always feel so um, honored about the numbers of you who are watching from all over the country and the world. So we're delighted that you're with us today. Um, it's really my great honor to introduce um, Dr. Kefferlin Brown. Um, Dr. Brown is professor and university distinguished teaching professor of cultural studies and education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Texas in Austin, but now I'm giving your talk. Oh, that's which okay. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> she also holds faculty appointments at other units at, the, at UT Austin, including the Department of African and African and African Diaspora Studies, the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies, and the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Dr. Brown was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I think there's some other people in the room who would claim that um, origin. Um, and she earned her PhD at the University of Wisconsin. But I think uh, what I've come to understand about um, Kefralyn is that it's her, in many ways, her growing up in Houston and going to um, college that has shaped and grounded so much of her work, growing up as a black girl and the kinds of stimulation and opportunities that she had at home, but also coming to discover over time how the opportunities for learning are so deeply and equitably distributed in our country and finding things later on in life that she didn't even know were possible, the opportunities for learning that didn't even exist. Um, she began to think a lot and deeply about the role that teaching and curriculum play in shaping our nation's continuing narratives and systems around race and that social, the ways in which social identities, race, class, gender, play in the work that teachers and students do together and what role that plays in the larger structures and systems of our country. Dr. Brown has been a leader in developing ways to change the way we educate children and teachers and to develop much needed learning about race and slavery in ways that break through the persistent challenges of discomfort, trauma, and, and thus avoidance that continue to perpetuate miseducation about systemic racism in our country. Dr. Kefflin Brown is the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Innovation in, in Race, Teaching, and Curriculum with Dr. Anthony Brown. Her research focuses on the sociocultural knowledge of race in teaching and curriculum, critical multicultural teaching edu teacher education, and the educational discourses and intellectual thought related to African Americans and their educational experience in the United States. Kefferlin has a distinguished record of research. She has over 50 publications, and I note that her Google Scholar numbers are you know, the slope of them looks like this. Well, to your perspective, like that. Right, which way? This way. Is that right? This way. Getting bigger and bigger over time, uh, um, including her uh, 2016 book, After the At-Risk Label, Reorienting Educational Policy and Practice. She has just rapidly broadening footprint in the field, and one runs across her work being cited in many places and being drawn upon. She's received a number of important awards for her research, including the AERA Division B Outstanding Book Award for the book Black Intellectual Thought in Education, The Missing Traditions of Anna Julia Cooper, Carter G. Woodson, and Alain Leroy Locke, which she co-authored with Carl Grant and Anthony Brown. She also earned the AERA Early Career Award and the Division K Mid-Career Award, which I was um, delighted to be in the room when she received that honor. She's also received and many people, you can't say this about so many scholars, also multiple recognitions for her teaching. Among them, something that I even had, it was just amazing, the Academy of Distinguished Teachers at the University of Texas at Austin, which represents a tiny, tiny percentage of the faculty at the University of Texas. It's an enormous honor, and also earned the Regents Outstanding Teaching Award. I'm gonna close um, by saying two things about her. One, about her current work. Um, Kefferlin is currently studying how teachers approach the teaching of U.S. and Texas slavery and how their students experience and make meaning of this instruction. But finally, I'll close in the words of one of her students who wrote, I think, probably in one of the nominations for these um, awards that she received, a student named David Barry. He wrote, quote, some days I would leave class and feel like crying about how little I knew about the countless contributions of black intellectuals to the field of education. I wonder if I would have ever learned about these great scholars and thinkers if not for Dr. Brown. Other days we would laugh out loud in class and I would leave feeling hopeful and a part of something larger than myself. I think that notion of something larger than ourselves will ca characterize the kind of learning we have opportunities to do this afternoon with Dr. Brown. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kefferlin Brown to the University of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm 
I've got to get myself organized. Can I borrow, can I, not borrow, because no one wants to have it after me, but can I have one of these waters? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction. You know, we, we, we often are asked as academics, and I hope that's not my phone. No, I don't think so. Um, we're asked to, to speak and um, to send in a bio. And usually people will read what's on the bio and it's what's on the internet. You know, it's, it's, it's something common. But I really appreciate the beautiful uh, words you gave because I did not write that. <laughs> I did not send that in. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay, let me put my water away. All right, good afternoon. Um, I, I'm thrilled to visit with you all today and to participate in this exciting uh, teacher work series. I want to thank Drs. Ball and Golden for the invitation and to all those working behind the scenes to make this event happen. Now we're going to be here for a bit of time and so um, my plan is to find ways, if possible, to have a little bit of participation um, in the in the talk, I mean, it won't be you won't have to get up or do anything other than maybe share something with the person that's sitting next to you. And then I might ask for a volunteer to share what you all have discussed. For those of you who are listening virtually, I, I, I hope that you'll participate as well, taking uh, notes or writing questions so that we can talk later at the end of the of the presentation. So my goals for this presentation are simple and straightforward. I want to inspire you to hold and to enact a commitment to socially just teaching and curriculum while holding up examples of the legacy of social justice both inside and outside of education. I'll also share some perspectives and an orientation designed to help educators develop, nurture, and let their own light shine toward this effort, even and especially when feel, having feelings of uncertainty, fear, or even despondency, which can happen while doing this work. Now, I was given the charge to ruminate on the words of sociologist Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot to, quote, pivot towards the light in pursuit of justice in education. I was immediately drawn to the idea of pivot, a word that has become popular in the world of business and leadership. When a person pivots, they remain affixed to where they are standing, yet can change their direction, holding the possibility of a 360 degree field of vision. So I present this talk in five parts. I begin by examining the word pivot and the promise it holds for changing our vision and actions. As we pivot towards the light, I ask us to reflect on the characteristics of light and its integral relationship to darkness. I argue that in pivoting towards the light of justice, we must always let our light shine, even as we hold sight of the darkness that surrounds us and threatens to consume our work. I offer two dark narratives of schooling that undermine equity alongside their related counter stories. These counter stories, rooted in a critical race theory framework, allows us to pivot away from dominant mainstream narratives. I conclude by considering the power of recognizing and harnessing critical sociocultural knowledge as a way to light a path towards justice. So I want to begin by asking you to visualize. Imagine a classroom that is working well. How does that classroom look? Who's in it? What's in it? What's happening? And what's not happening? Take a few moments to see that effective classroom in your mind. Now, if you're sitting next to someone, maybe take a few moments, and it won't even be probably maybe 30 seconds, to talk about what you, what you see in that room, that ideal room.
about 10 more seconds. Okay, if we could come back together. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to share one idea? Oh, oh, okay. So I won't ask y'all. Okay, so if you share, will someone just share a few things that you saw? Okay, that'd be great. Anybody want to share? Thank you. So Darius and I imagined the same classroom. Um, it was an all black classroom with a black instructor. Um, the child, the teacher was moving around, clearly facilitating the classroom, uh, but the children were highly engaged with each other. And though they were doing serious work, it had a degree of levity and joy in the space. Sounds good, thank you so much for sharing. So for me, an effective classroom is one where students, regardless of race, social class, gender, sexuality, language, and ability, are engaged, learning new knowledge and skills, and putting them to use in novel, creative ways. They receive a curriculum that reflects knowledge connected to their own backgrounds, while exposing them to a variety of perspectives and range of knowledges, including those which reflect students' families and communities. Students work independently and collaboratively with their peers, and they are excited to come to school. They have strong, caring, and respectful relationships with their teachers and peers. And when conflict happens, there is a process for addressing disagreements and changing unhelpful behaviors in a way that is both humane and affirming. In this classroom, students and teachers dialogue together. They write, read, compute, solve, experiment, discuss, and create at the highest levels. They also have opportunities to think critically about the world that existed before them and the world they currently live while imagining possibilities for a world they wish to inhabit but is not yet to be. The students love themselves and recognize their beauty. They feel no pressure to change who they are or to morph themselves into a caricature image for acceptance. This classroom is also a place for growing. This means that mistakes will happen, and yes, sometimes teachers and students will find themselves uncertain about how to answer a question or address a problem. They may, they may feel uncertainty and fear, but they do not give up or become resistant or defensive about making any changes that are necessary to make that classroom work for all. I begin this presentation by asking you to imagine because the classrooms we envision, the one I shared, and I think the one you shared as well, do not reflect the norm found in most U.S. schools. I also want you to know the vision of school that informs the perspective and approaches that I will be talking about today. One of the most intractable challenges in education is improving the educational opportunities historically marginalized U.S. school children have access to daily. Confronting this problem is likely the reason why many of you are here today. If you are like me, this is the one concern that keeps me up at night and fuels my work as a researcher and teacher educator. Now my first encounter with the idea of pivot was in the context of playing basketball. And I have to say I've been doing a lot of watching basketball. And of course with the tragedy that happened Saturday, uh, Sunday, I've been thinking a lot about basketball. Pivoting is a fundamental skill in the game. Basketball has rules about how players can move after they stop dribbling, yet while still holding the ball. Once stopping with the ball in hand, a player can shoot the ball or pass it to another player. To move into another direction, the only option is to pivot. Pivoting allows the player to change directions while standing still on one foot and moving the other foot as the body is rotated into the desired direction. Knowing how to pivot is important because without it, a player is likely to receive a traveling violation, which someone on my beloved Longhorn basketball team did last night, <laughs> which can make the difference in the outcome of a single possession or even the game. 
Now, as we think about Professor Lawrence Lightfoot's idea of pivoting towards the light of justice in the context of teaching and teacher education, she asks that we take stock of where we are standing, remaining clear about the nature of that place, one filled with challenge, difficulty, injustice, and what may seem like an impossible opportunity for movement. Yet in this place, we do move, rotating and shifting our bodies into another direction that opens up the promise of hope and transformed action. Theorizing light and dark. Now, when you hear the word light, what comes to mind? And you could just think about this. In a recent issue of the Journal of Energy uh, History Review, issue editors Stephanie Legalic and Sarah Pritchard noted the study of light and darkness as an expanding area of scholarship in the humanities and social sciences. This scholarship theorizes lightness as having multiple facets and possessing an inextricable relationship to darkness. As a result, the study of light and darkness reflect a set of complex relations related to, excuse me, a complex relations related to multiple definitions and characteristics of light and dark, point out nuances in how temporal technologies produce light and dark, and raise justice concerns around who has access to certain forms of light. The authors further note the inherent Western-centric focus that often accompanies discussions of light and dark. Now, before moving forward in this talk, I must acknowledge how the metaphor of light, historically and culturally, has been linked to Western notions of progress and development. Across time and through cultural practices, the notion of light has helped shape perceptions of and preferences for light over dark in European and other Western spaces like our own. I fully recognize this challenging context as I embrace the charge I have been given to help point our work towards the light of justice. But I also recognize how black communities historically have picked up and rearticulated these ideas to center their own justice work towards freedom in embracing the light, as embracing the light. So from this standpoint, it makes sense when the editors of the special issue on theorizing light and dark ask us to change reductionist frameworks that focus on light alone without reference to darkness. One cannot study light without acknowledging darkness because they exist symbiotically. They quite literally allow each other to exist. So how does this help us make sense of light and dark? In, matter, in, in order to understand light, we must acknowledge its connection to darkness. In her book, Dark Matters, on the surveillance of blackness, sociologist Simone Brown writes about technologies of surveillance used to monitor the movements of black people during slavery. Light was both a hindrance, it made the person trying to hide visible, and a form of cover and protection. Brown opens chapter two with the words of scholar France Fanon, who said about African diasporic peoples, our history takes place in obscurity, and the sun I carry with me must lighten every corner. These words illuminate how black people, and all historically marginalized people really, have always drawn from both light and darkness to bear witness to and bring light to injustice, while working often at the risk of life towards its eradication. We don't have to look far in history to see evidence of this dance between light and dark for African diasporic peoples. Anti-blackness, soul values, and shining lights. For example, anti-blackness can be understood as a defining societal ethos in the US that views and acts upon black people as less than human. Anti-blackness is a mood, a way of being that is normalized and so fully integrated into the fabric of dominant society that it often goes unrecognized and unacknowledged. How did we arrive at anti-blackness as a defining characteristic in how our dominant society and its institutions address black peoples? Well, this question is too massive to unpack in our time today. However, scholars like Ibram Kendi highlight the role of the history of racist ideas that emerged during the Enlightenment period of the, 19, of the 1500s and have continued to grow and morph over time and space as the seed and nurturing of U.S. anti-black sentiment. 
Building on the work of Sadia Hartman, theorist Christina Sharp argues that transatlantic slavery created the conditions for anti-blackness to flourish. What germinated in the institution of slavery continues to impact us today. The author noted, while all modern subjects are post-slavery subjects fully constituted by the discursive codes of slavery and post-slavery, post-slavery subjectivity is largely born and readable on the new world black subject. Thinking about monstrous intimacies, post-slavery means examining those subjectivities constituted from transatlantic slavery onward and connected then as now by the everyday mundane horrors that aren't acknowledged to be horrors. Sharp alerts us why we can't ever let dark horrors, however great or mundane, they may be in our everyday societal life and practices go unacknowledged. Not seeing and recognizing the dark is what allowed, and I would argue continues to allow, anti-blackness to flourish unfettered and exponentially. And this is why we cannot lose sight of the dark, even as we seek out the light. But let me be emphatically clear. Darkness has never had the power to extinguish the light. Even in the most horrific of times, historian Dinah Ramey Berry has theorized the idea of soul values to capture, quote, the internal self-worth African Americans held on to when external forces literally and figuratively sought to strip them of humanity, end quote. And here, she, uh, 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 Professor Berry is talking about um, enslavement. Now, while talking about enslavement and the humanizing ways that enslaved black people maintain their sense of self, even in the face of violence and degradation, Barry implores us to remember in the face of adversity the existence of marginalized people's little lights and the everyday ways they shine them in the world. So going back to Lawrence Lightfoot's call then, we must seek out and pivot towards the light, as Sharp later stated, aspiration. Aspiration is the word that I arrived at for keeping and putting breath in the black body. Living as I have argued we do in the wake of slavery, in spaces where we were never meant to survive or have been punished for surviving and for daring to claim or make spaces of something like freedom, we yet reimagine and transform spaces for and practices of an ethics of care, as in repair, maintenance, attention, an ethics of seeing and of being in the wake as consciousness, as a way of remembering and observance that started with the door of no return, continued in the hold of the ship and on the shore. From the enslaved Africans who survived the horrific transatlantic journey to the Americas, to national warriors like Harriet Tubman, whose inner light oriented her towards a quest for freedom, her own, her family's, and her other brothers, black brothers and sisters in bondage, we also find this relationship in the example of Ida B. Wells, a journalist who decided that the light of her pen, which she used to document the dark atrocities of black lynching and white racial violence towards black people, offered a syllabus created for black freedom. And then of course there's W.E.B. Du Bois, the first black man to receive a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. His prolific scholarship began at the turn of the 20th century and did not end until, 19, until the 1960s. He offered incisive critique coupled with robust evidence, analysis, and theorization about the oppressive conditions and inspired hope of black life in the U.S. Now one example of how light and dark exist is found in the following examples. In 1900, Professor Charles Carroll authored the book, The Negro a Beast where he argued that black people were beasts and not humans. Carroll drew from the Judeo-Christian Bible and theology, along with various other fields, which he referred to as scientific, to make his claims. Historians Ibram Kendi and George Fredrickson have noted the importance of this book in shaping the societal image of black people as savage and more akin to apes, and this legacy continues to live with us even into contem contemporary times. The same year, Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, was asked to curate a social study about black American life for the Paris Exposition. This exhibit included about 60 state-of-the-art data visualizations using relevant primary and secondary data, photographs, texts, and objects. Understanding the politics and power of the visual, Du Bois used this vehicle 
to transform existing narratives of black people who were three decades removed at the time from enslavement. The exhibition director, Thomas Calloway, who knew thousands of people would attend the fair and the black exhibit, felt it would, quote, do a great and lasting good in convincing thinking people of the possibilities of the Negro, end quote. We have another example of dark and light as reflected in the publication of a Coon Alphabet and the Brownies books. In a paper I published with Professor Anthony Brown, we discussed the book A Coon Alphabet, published by William Kim Kimball in 1889, the well-known illustrator of author Mark Twain's novels. The book was stylized as a traditional alphabet book, with each letter depicting stereotypical and violent images of black children and adults as bug-eyed piccaninnies being devoured by animals, recklessly shooting themselves with guns, and as the target of myriad violent mishaps. These images reflected a common racial imagery that existed in other children's literature that featured black people during this time. The Brownies books, on the other hand, were a monthly magazine created by Du Bois in 1920 for black children and youth. The goal of the publication was to introduce African-American children to the important history and achievements of black people in America. The magazine included multi-genre texts and illustrations, in addition to reports on the international cultures, articles about the accomplishments of young people from all over the country, and photographs and other beautiful artwork created by African-American artists. These examples, as well as those cited earlier, offer insight into the relationship between light and dark. It is the dark that fuels the light, and without seeing and acknowledging the reality of the dark, we can't manifest the transformative shine we wish to with the light. So if light and darkness exist coterminously, how can we use this knowledge to understand the relationship of oppression and resistance? And what does this relationship teach us about pivoting towards the light? How can this relationship inform and assist our commitment to center justice in teaching and teacher education? Making the pivot possible. Critical race theory in education offers us a way to pivot towards the light as we seek to center justice in teaching and teacher education. Originating from legal studies, CRT offers insights into the foundational role of race in our society, including schooling. It seeks to examine why racial disparities continue to exist in the U.S. even after the dismantling of race-based legal segregation. Counter storytelling is one way of looking at and making sense of the centrality of race. Counter storytelling is a practice of storytelling, but it encompasses all of its varieties. And it narrates the role and impact of race in a way that runs counter to dominant stories. CRT can help us understand some fundamental challenges that impede efforts to teach in socially just ways. For example, <clears throat> a CRT analysis, analysis would ask us to think about how race exists in the teaching and curriculum process. One way we can identify the existence of race is located in stories told about the purposes of schooling. In their book, Teaching for Social Justice, authors Oakes, Lipton, Anderson, and Stillman present two such foundational stories that teachers must address if they want to center justice in their teaching. The first story is meritocracy and its legacy in public schooling. The argument goes that U.S. public schooling was and continues to serve as the great equalizer, as stated by Horace Mann. This means that individuals who possess the most natural talent or engage in the hardest work will rise to the top and find academic and societal success and they can do so because the institution of, of schooling um, operates in a meritocratic way. If K-12 schooling reflects a real meritocracy, that would mean that schools and schooling operate in relatively equal ways for all students. <clears throat> the only difference then would be the level of effort or natural talent the students display. Yet a counter story to the meritocracy narrative would argue that people have access to differently valued societal resources before beginning school, during the time they attend school, and after their schooling ends. This counter story also recognizes that meritocracy doesn't account for the different kinds of opportunities to learn that students have across different school and classroom contexts. These are too vast and complex to outline in this, in this presentation, but they impact how students are viewed and acted upon by educators, 
the kind of curriculum and teaching opportunities students can acquire, how classrooms are organized for student learning, and the expectations educators hold for their students. Using meritocracy to justify why some students find academic success while others do not disavows the responsibility of educational decision making and the power of teaching. Teachers and teaching matter. The second story discussed by Oakes et al. is the relationship between deficit thinking, racial superiority, and white privilege. Deficit thinking is the belief that the source of students' underachievement or underperformance in schools is solely because of something they genetically or culturally lack. Deficit thinking places blame on individuals rather than considering how societal assumptions, histories, and structural and institutional inequities and practices play a role in structuring outcomes. Deficit thinking has a long history in education, which stems from deeply entrenched societal beliefs that certain groups had more or less ability than other groups. And some of the examples that I gave previously help us to see how that <clears throat> those beliefs became sedimented in, the, in its early, in, in its infancy in our country. <clears throat> These determinations were rooted in racial classifications with groups from Western European backgrounds identified as the most intellectually capable and those from African descent as the least capable and even savage. Racial superiority framed these perspectives and as a result created a societal racial hierarchy that privileged white people both materially and symbolically. In the US, white people have historically had more access and accumulated opportunities in society than have had people of color. Just having a racial identification as white offers symbolic pri privileges that one does not have to earn or work to acquire. The only requirement is that the person is viewed as white. It is not surprising then that our country has a long history of people willing to assimilate and give up their ethnic and cultural identities and practices and sometimes even their families just to be recognized as legally or socially white. Teachers who want to teach for social justice must understand the complex stories of meritocracy, deficit thinking, racial superiority, and white privilege to avoid drawing from them in their practice. These play out in instructional decisions and judgments that are made about how to teach, what to teach, and about our students that are, uh, that are informed by unexamined no norms of whiteness. The problem is that many teachers go into classrooms not understanding race or without having experience interrogating whiteness. This is the case for all teachers, I would argue, and my work would suggest. Um, as K-12 schools and teacher education writ large doesn't do a, a, a good job of critically addressing issues of race and helping our students learn how to do so as well. But it is particularly the case for white teachers who also often have limited personal experience to draw from either. Our society has a paradoxical relationship to race. As a nation, we're drawn to the topic, yet we recoil from addressing it in systematic and productive ways. Scholars have called this color blindness and more recently color evasion. This refers to the practice of choosing not to acknowledge how race exists in and impacts society. In some cases, color evasiveness in schools translates into an absence or even unwillingness to consider how race plays out in the everyday realities of teaching and learning. This can lead to denials that race matters or the practice of replacing race-based explanations with cultural deficiency arguments that locate the cause of racial disparities on presumed cultural deficiencies of individuals or groups. If educators want to teach for social justice, they must interrogate the pervasive stories that inform U.S. schooling. Colorblind and evasive practices make whiteness and practices of white privilege normal. This allows educators to disavow the significance of race in schooling, approach curriculum as racially and sociopolitically neutral, and devoid of power, read and act on students in disproportional, disparate ways, and hold students of color to low expectations for learning. All of these are practices we find too often in K-12 school settings. In our efforts to teach in a just way, we cannot ignore the darkness. It is imperative that we understand it, recognize it when it appears, and pivot our work accordingly. Pivoting to sociocultural knowledge. 
The stories I just discussed are a few that undermine equitable and just teaching. But they are more than just stories. They are part of a particular kind of knowledge that educators and others hold about the nature of schooling and what's appropriate and not to discuss in schools. I call this knowledge sociocultural knowledge, and I argue it is foundational to, yet often under-acknowledged in teaching and teacher education. Now, when I use the term sociocultural knowledge, I refer to knowledge related to social and cultural matters and contexts that exist in schools. One way to understand sociocultural knowledge is to think about the other kinds of knowledge that exist in teaching. Disciplinary knowledge, such as the kind that reflects what teachers know about mathematics, science, literacy, and social studies comes to mind. Another kind of knowledge that exists in teaching is knowledge about child and adolescent development. We can also identify pedagogical content knowledge, how do we actually teach certain content area, organizational knowledge, what do we know about how we organize our classrooms. My research in teaching focuses on how sociocultural knowledge operates in, everyday, in the everyday work of teaching. This knowledge informs how educators make decisions about what content and materials to share with students and the method that should be used to help students learn. Sociocultural knowledge informs how teachers view their role and responsibility as teachers, as well as perspectives they hold about their students and the families, communities, and cultures of the, their students. Many of their everyday professional decisions and judgments, many of the everyday de professional decisions and judgments made by educators are informed by sociocultural matters even when they aren't recognized as such, and most times they aren't. They're not even acknowledged or even seen as such. My interest in sociocultural matters of teaching and curriculum is not, is not novel. It is part of a legacy of scholarship designed to transform teaching and curriculum that is ignored, misrepresented, or minimized the importance of sociocultural knowledge in teaching and curriculum practices. For example, since the 1970s, multicultural scholars like James Banks, Carl Grant, Geneva Gay, and Christine Sleeter advanced different typologies of multicultural schooling that centered around providing students more equitable curriculum and teaching practices. Other scholars like Jacqueline Jordan Irvine, Carol Lee, Anna Marie Viegas, and Gloria Latson Billings advanced pedagogies that recognized culture and power in their culturally responsive, culture-centered, and culturally relevant teaching approaches. Others, like Joyce King, attended closely to transforming the curriculum and Arnitha Ball on leveraging the generative nature of culture-centered pedagogy in and outside of formal classroom settings. But all of this work, built on the legacy of scholars of color who came before them, like Carter G. Woodson, who had a deep understanding of the dark, recognizing how a normalizing whiteness allowed inaccurate and misrepresented curriculum knowledge about black people to solidify a place in official school curriculum. His life's work and legacy were to shine light on black knowledge and its underrecognized contribution and excellence. This legacy continues into the present, launching from Latson Billings' culturally relevant pedagogy, Django Paris advanced a culturally sustaining pedagogy that asks educators to attend to culture while also accounting for its complex expression for contemporary students. Scholar Christopher Emden's reality pedagogy is another example. And finally, curriculum scholar Bettina Love brings a light to bear in her call for abolitionist teaching, where teachers pivot towards justice by resisting the quick fix reforms and practices that marginalize already disenfranchised students. These scholars and so many others did not have the goal of creating a foolproof method that anyone could simply pick up and use to ensure enactment of equitable and just teaching. They knew this was impossible to do and that such teaching requires serious work, attention, and time, just like teaching any other content area. These scholars keenly recognized that mainstream teaching was grounded in an expansive kind of knowledge integrally linked to belief systems and societal stories deeply entrenched in our nation's fabric. These contexts were complex, knotty, and difficult to untangle. 
They required an awareness of sociocultural knowledge, but also a willingness to learn, grow, and engage sociocultural knowledge critically and reflexively in practice. These scholars also realized that the work of the socially just teacher, who was educating historically marginalized children of color, was never only about making sure these children could read, write, compute, and think well. Nor was it only about helping them make a good grade on a test or get into college. They authentically cared about their students. They also wanted to ensure the students acquired knowledge and skills for academic success while maintaining a strong sense of self and the ability to see, critique, and act towards social justice. I call these scholars light bearers, and they, along with their work, reflect the longstanding legacy and promise of centering justice in teaching and curriculum. This is what fuels the work of light bearers, past and present. Unfortunately, in many academic policy and practical settings, their work has been ignored, viewed as unnecessary, or when considered, enacted only superficially and without deep engagement and commitment. Yet when we take their legacy seriously, pivoting to understand and, in and incorporate their fullest expression in our practices, we bear witness to the light and let our light, own light shine. Becoming a light bearer. To become a light bearer teacher, we must teach in ways that are hopeful, caring, equitable, skillful, humanizing, responsive, socio-politically aware, and I'll add joyful too from this from earlier. Yet we must do this in a world in a schooling system that is oriented towards inequity and injustice. What attributes are needed to begin this journey? Whether working with preparing, novel, or experienced educators. While there are many, I will discuss four that I think are foundational and a good place to begin the journey. The first is to remain a constant learner. And to be a constant learner, one needs to be open. This, is a willing, this signals a willingness to learn by creating a space to seek out new ideas and perspectives. It requires a vulnerability that acknowledges that the uncertainty that deep learning brings. One also needs to be curious. A curious mind is open and excited to learn. It initiates asking questions and rooting out answers that lead to deeper understandings. One must be engaged. You can't ask questions without taking up an intentional engagement to learn. Engaged learners are mindful and present to learning. Fearlessness. Fearless leaders must, must stretch beyond personal comfort zones. This is going to be difficult, challenging work. And it's not a sort of fly by night, I'm going to take a course and then I'll be done, or take a professional development and I'll be done. It is lifelong work. Um, and one must not fear pivoting and changing directions when needed. The second attribute is, acqu is acquiring sociopolitical awareness. To acquire sociopolitical awareness, educators need to have knowledge and understanding of the dark the history of and ongoing practices of oppression and inequity. Educators shouldn't become despondent or uh, cynical by this knowledge, but rather use it to inspire con continued action, especially when encountering challenges and complexities. There is no set curriculum to learn, but there are important entry points, I would argue, particularly when studying or thinking about issues of race. One is understanding it as a social construct, that has material impact. And the second is understanding the difference between interpersonal and institutional structural racism. I mean, I think you could probably spend a teacher education program focusing on those two alone. Gaining a beginning level of knowledge is possible through university coursework, particularly at the foundational level of teacher education. And I, had, I did a study uh, a, a few years back with uh, students of color. Uh, many of whom, they were all in our teacher ed program, and many of whom talked about the fact that they really didn't know a whole lot about race, that they came into their teacher ed program with some experiential knowledge, but not knowing a whole lot about race. But what they had learned about race, they either learned from their families or they learned at the university taking specific classes on the topic. More attention should be given to developing this knowledge base by requiring coursework in ethnic studies and in the social sciences. 
Having opportunities to apply this knowledge later in real life classroom and teaching context is needed as well. Finding ways to help uh, 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 beginning teachers think about how sociocultural knowledge is playing out in the classroom through the decisions that they're making and the things that they're seeing. The third is searching for the good, or what sociologist Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot calls recognizing the goodness in others by seeking to find the assets and strengths that students bring to school. Doing this inspires and empowers us to act in critical, transformative ways. Fundamentally, we need to shift our focus away from identifying what students lack, either academically or in their home or community environments, to acknowledging the assets and resources that students bring with them to school. We do this when we approach students not as objects, but as <clears throat> but as human beings, full of potential and ability to learn and achieve. It also requires that students, that schools and teachers operate as partners in students' academic lives and not knowledgeable authorities who need to put knowledge into their students. Instead, the goal is to, to mine out, as uh, Professor Ladson Billings has reminded us, valued knowledge <clears throat> that students bring with them and help them to make those bridges to new knowledge. These connections, these connections bridge school, family, and communities, but also encourage teachers to work collaboratively with colleagues and, and other community members and family members, shining their collective lights of justice. Fourth is acknowledging the power of teaching, and I really appreciate um, um, Dr. Ball talking about the power of teaching, which I believe in strongly. The teaching encounter, whether where the teacher and the student meet, holds potential problems and possibility, whether in a classroom between teachers and youth, teachers and children, youth or adults. Teaching matters. No, teaching alone cannot end racism, sexism, heteronormativity, economic inequality, or language and religious or ability discrimination. It also can't transform our communities into society it can't transform our communities and our society into just and equitable places where all have full access to the democratic promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet teaching serves as a microcosm of our society. Teaching encounters bring people together, each with their own desires, experiences, knowledge, and perspectives, all that collide with the histories and expectations of the varied communities in which they are a part. I believe in the power of teaching and teachers, and as such, I have devoted my work to considering those thorny places where we can see and think differently about our work. We are charged to do every day in the classroom. How do we make it count, truly make it count? This is my starting point for arguing why we must see the process of teaching as one of continually becoming. We are always continually becoming, and we never, ever, ever will arrive, no matter how great of a teacher we may think we are. And I take these words from former First Lady Michelle Obama. Teaching is always about becoming. Equitable and just, light bearer teachers, lit to transform the darkest of conditions, individual, group, institutional, and systemic, that th threaten to undermine the full flourishing of students. We can shine our lights for equity and justice in teaching through a teaching approach I call a humanizing critical sociocultural knowledge of teaching. And actually, I don't want to say the word approach. I want to say orientation. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. This orientation is culturally affirming and recognizes sociocultural knowledge as foundational in its work. It approaches teaching as improvisational, situated, and all-encompassing. It is not a set of prescribed teaching methods, but a stance, an orientation that teachers use to guide the judgments and decision making, to, to, to decide, to guide judgments and decision making in their teaching. Now, first, a critical humanizing sociocultural knowledge of teaching is improvisational. Now, in my experience, people get a little nervous when they hear the word improvise in teaching. I have a friend who gets very nervous. She always hates to hear me say that. She's not an educator, she's a journalist, so it's another thing. But I want to draw from the following definition <clears throat> of improvisation, or improvise. To make or fabricate out of what is conveniently on hand. Now, 
if what's conveniently on hand is what we want to have, then improv being an improvisational teacher is not a problem. Right? Using this term does not mean then that teachers are not invested in clear planning. It does not mean that they don't hold high expectations for student learning or a commitment to provide a culturally affirming learning experience. Like jazz, a musical art form that is grounded in standard music compositions, but that bends, stretches, reinterprets, and transforms these basic pieces. <clears throat> they offer, it offers something fresh during each new reiteration. This is nearly impossible to do for the musician who lacks substantial technical knowledge and skill about music and music performance. Foundationally then, this teaching orientation does not rely on learning a few specific methods, anchor lessons, or quick teaching tricks. And I say this like many other people who do this work. That is often what I'm asked to give when I go and do a, uh, a, a, maybe a professional development. Can you tell me two or three things that I can do that will then make me be a socially just teacher? Okay, so I'm speaking to that sort of impetus and spirit. <clears throat> this, uh, this orientation understands the need to embrace teaching as fluid, flexible, and, and practices that must continually grow to meet the unique needs of our students. When encountering potentially useful methods, the improvisational teacher will try them out as well as will revise them as needed. The teacher that holds an orientation that values improvisation knows that what works in one time or space or with a particular set of students isn't necessarily going to work in or with another. This orientation to teaching remains committed to asset-based critical understandings of teaching that account for how power and inequities exist in classrooms and are implicated in teachers' instructional decision making. In fact, this is the knowledge that is conveniently on hand and well established in their reservoirs of understanding. Second, a humanizing critical sociocultural knowledge of teaching is situated and contextual. <clears throat> it's embedded in the everyday life of teaching. For example, how should teachers make decisions about what to teach and how to teach it? What knowledge should, should they draw upon? How should teachers decide if a student is making adequate academic progress? How should a teacher determine if she or he is successfully meeting their students' needs? How should teachers read students' behavior in class? When is student behavior perceived as appropriate or not? When, it is, when, it, when it's viewed as inappropriate, <clears throat> if and how do teachers make judgments about why it's occurring in class? Is it about students' will or choice? Or about conditions related to the classroom environment and culture? Or about approaches to teaching and curriculum? in the teacher's classroom. These are only a few of the so many questions that teachers address daily in their work that deal with the context of sociocultural knowledge. The contextual nature of sociocultural knowledge requires that teachers acknowledge how sociocultural concerns exist in their everyday work and decision, decision and judgment making. It means understanding how sociocultural factors like race, social class, gender, and culture privilege and curtail student opportunities to learn. Teachers must see and not shy away from addressing inequitable or unjust conditions because of fear or a need to appear nice. They see the dark for what it is, a context that makes teaching for justice imperative. It fuels and drives their work. To address the sociocultural uh, socio complexities in teachers' everyday decision making, I offer these questions as a guiding tool for critical reflection. What is the context, historic and local, that informs this teaching moment? Under what conditions, for what reasons, and to whose benefit am I making this particular curricula or pedagogic choice? Third, a humanizing critical sociocultural knowledge of teaching is all encompassing. When we acknowledge and choose to forefront sociocultural matters in our teaching, we do so because these issues concern all aspects of schooling. We do not do it only because students of color are in our class or because we want to bring in more diverse curriculum in the classroom. Both of these are important considerations and things that we should be engaging in. But they aren't the only or primary reason to focus on, to acknowledge, a humanizing critical sociocultural knowledge in teaching. We need to do this work because it impacts all of our work 
not only select parts of it. And I've given you all some examples of this um, um, within the talk, but it, I mean, it impacts our, the identities of teachers and students and the social locations they come from, the curriculum choices and teaching choices that are made in the classroom, the knowledge that comprises even the disciplinary knowledge that's taught in the classroom, how those knowledges came to be and how some knowledge is not com uh, considered a part of that work. We can go back to Carter G. Woodson's um, admonition. Uh, how teachers organize the classroom and students to learn, as well as the beliefs they hold about the purposes of schooling, their role and responsibility as teachers, and how they view their students and the families and communities from which they come. Now, in this talk, I asked us to consider the legacy of light bearers as they understand the need to navigate between the dark and light. This work never was nor is easy. It requires courage, knowledge, and an urgent need to act, an urgent need to learn, act, and reflect continuously. I am reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his fiery text, Why We Can't Wait. Published in 1963, this work was a reminder of the continued importance of nonviolent social change in the U.S. This text brought attention to the dehumanizing conditions that characterized black life and the promise of the movement to transform these conditions. He expressed disappointment with white Christians who sympathized with the freedom fighters but lacked urgency in combating injustice. Like his fellow light bearers, Dr. King, too, realized the power of acknowledging the dark while pivoting toward the light. Dr. King stated, and this is really powerful, so, it, and so it's a lot of text and I'm going to read through it. Dr. King stated, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. Perhaps it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kick your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children when see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a negro living constantly at tiptoe stance then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait the intensity of the comparisons between concerns during the civil rights movement and our own contemporary times offer a way to similarly consider why we can't wait or ignore the need to address injustice in classrooms and schools either. So this is my um, revised take, inspired by Dr. King 57 years ago. Consider this. We have waited for more than 100 years for schools that equitably meet the needs of students of color. Perhaps it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging invisibility or demeaning depictions of one's racial group in the official school curriculum offered in schools to say, wait. But when you have seen a disproportionate number of marginalized students referred for special education or for disciplinary offenses, even when you are only in preschool, when you, your family, and the racial groups from which you come are presumed not to care about schooling, when assumptions are made about your ability or intelligence on the basis of your race background, when you attend schools that are physically dilapidated or under-resourced, when your school offers a narrow, scripted curriculum that offers no opportunity for creative, innovative, collaborative, and joyful learning experiences, when your school operates more like a prison than an environment of learning, growth, and development, when your learning experiences and curriculum opportunities fall short of those experienced by your peers in other public schools that had few students of color 
or those from lower income or working class backgrounds, when you're the only or one of only a handful of people who look like you in your class and in your school, when people draw from race to read you and interact with you, while at the same time denying that race even matters in that space, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait to acknowledge and address injustice in K-12 schooling. I would argue that the light bearers who have come before us in education felt this way, knew these things. And even under conditions where they weren't listened to, their work wasn't acknowledged, they did not wait. We live and educate in trying times and we cannot wait for the system to change. We must be the change inside the system. Yes, we must be the change, the difference makers, the light bearers, pivoting towards justice. And to do this, we need to value and take seriously sociocultural knowledge as integral in the work of schooling. And then we must harness a critical orientation toward that sociocultural knowledge, leveraging it for more just and equitable schooling for all students. When we do these things, we let our lights shine individually and collectively, bringing a fuller expression of justice to our practice. We cannot wait to do these things. We owe it to ourselves and to our students. Our lives and our prosperity depend on it. It is time, and in fact, it is well beyond the time for us to all be the lit, light-bearing educators both our students and our world needs. Thank you all very much for listening, and I look forward to talking with you now um, more in a discussion. Thanks. really want to hear your questions, but we invite you to come up to the microphone so that those who are not in the room can hear your question. And I want to remind those of you who are watching online that we want to hear your voice also, and you can tweet us. I'll give you that handle, even though it's quite obvious. It's TW Seminar. That's all it is. So please tweet us your questions as well. Um, I was struck at the end when you, I think it was, it, when you, the phrase of for whose benefit, um, the point where teachers had to reflect upon that. Could you say a little bit more about that? Because I think that's critical, particularly as you think about under what conditions and whether teachers sometimes have the, how much power teachers have and how they think through how their approach to instruction can mm -hmm. always be in the benefit of the children, or benefit for the children, um, and where they can wrench power and agency in some in the very constrained spaces in which they find themselves working. <clears throat> Thank you for asking that question. When I was thinking about the, and I've written about this and have used these questions before. I, I, the thought behind it was to bring awareness that sometimes we make decisions. Um, and we might sort of know why we're doing it, but a lot of times we might not know. And to have to stop and take stock of why am I choosing to do this right now? And who will this actually help? Or who will it impact? I think is a pretty powerful question. And there may be some instances where there's little control the teacher may have. And the teacher may know that they are making a decision to benefit the institution. But it seems to me that you want to be aware of that. Um, I'm reminded of um, years ago, um, my son, who's now 10, but he was maybe three, uh, he went to a Montessori school and we loved the school. And they had very specific ways that they thought about um, discipline. 
and what you would think of maybe as classroom management. And I remember having a conversation with a psychologist who worked with the school. And, and you know, we were talking and I said, yeah, you know, the, 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 the philosophy of Montessori really is, um, is very interesting and in, in how cl uh, classroom management gets picked up. And she said, that's not about Montessori education. It's about making sure that things don't get out of whack because you've got children doing a whole lot of different things in that room. And if you don't have that in place, then it could go haywire. It was very powerful for me because in my mind, I had never really thought about, and I, you would think that I would have, um, I had never really thought about how a decision may be picked up and may be rationalized as in one way, but really it's, it's to benefit, I guess, you know, it's to benefit the kids. You don't want the children to be hurt, but also it, it's not just solely about um, this sort of pristine philosophy. And I think it's important to think about that. Sometimes we as teachers might do something because we're fearful and we're making a choice. We're not gonna do class discussion because I'm afraid that this might go haywire. But who does that benefit? So thank you for asking that. Good evening, Zama. It's a little late. Great talk. I have two questions. I hope they're quick, and you can choose to answer at least one of them, or neither of them. I probably can. Look, you're the only one in line, so you know, I could probably answer both. I'm really fascinated with the idea of um, improvisation, okay. and you're using the um, the parallel with jazz. And so I was curious. Could you say a little bit? And you gave some examples, but could you say a little bit more about what do you perceive as the foundational knowledges? Um, that would allow one to be able to mm -hmm. improvise is the first question. Okay. Um, the second question is, given your research, given the talk, I'm curious to see in your eyes, what do you imagine as a, a ideal teacher education program? Like what does oh. that trajectory look like? Oh my gosh. The courses, <laughs> the type of experiences, it could just be orientations, <laughs> but I'm just, okay. yeah, I'm just curious. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, I'm going to probably speak in generalities much more general than you would want me to, to speak um, because I don't, I, I don't have a, a book. I mean, I guess I'd be rich. I'd be, I don't know, I'd be telling y'all how to put the teacher ed program together if I had that packet. But I'll, 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 try, to, I'll try to speak in, in a broad layout. When I think about improvisation, I think that they're, I, I, I sort of laid out what I think is going to be important. Of course, you, you've got to have all of the knowledge you need around your content and how to teach that content. I think that's all really important. I also think it's important to know, you know, how children develop and how they move and, and grow. Um, but when we think about sociocultural knowledge, I think that it's important for us to have a handle on at least the fact that our society has operated historically in inequitable ways. Um, and, and that's from its very founding. And I think it's important for us to have an understanding of how different groups have fared in this country. Um, some of their experiences trying to navigate in educational systems. I was asking my students Tuesday night in the Sociocultural Foundations course, how many of them have had a, a class in the history of schooling? These are doctoral students. No one had had a course in the history of schooling. So they didn't, you know, they sort of know, well, you know, there must have been some, it was segregated, it was inequitable, but they don't really know how those practices played out. They don't know the struggle in my black education course. They definitely don't know the struggle, how groups rallied together, um, put money together to create schools. I think having an understanding of how how our society has operated in equitable ways, and how we how how historically um, groups have fought to get an education or to get a schooling to get a get quality schooling would be important. I would say that I, if I had my druthers, if there's one thing I would put in a teacher education program, that I don't know of any teacher education program that makes this a requirement. And I'm sure there probably is one, but I'm not familiar with it. Is that all teachers must take ethnic studies, some ethnic studies courses, African American studies, Mexican American studies. Because in those courses, epistemically, at the center of the course is the group you're looking at. So you get a wider array of histories and then ways that people have approached 
uh, within that group have have approached their sort of their 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 their, uh, their movement throughout society. And I think that that I found that students that bring that with them, they have a foundation of sociocultural knowledge that they're able to then parlay into a better understanding of things they see in a classroom. Another thing that I um, uh, that I would argue we need we need to think about some of these wonderful theoretical frameworks that we use in our in our in our scholarship to talk about inequities find ways to help our students understand how that those those theories don't exist in a vacuum they actually can play out in the classroom like can you imagine helping your students see we're going to use we're going to use CRT um, whiteness is property it happens in schools, it happens in classrooms and classroom practices and curriculum. And I really believe that if we take some of what we know and find ways to translate it for our students, um, they can take, they, they, will, they will have frameworks that they then will be able to use when they go into the classroom and see what another teacher might not see. They may see the same, you may see the same incident, but read it differently because you have a different framework that you're applying. So I'm talking about history. I'm talking about um, thinking about um, disciplines that recenter and call to question some of the very power structures that we would want our students to better understand. Those would need to be a part. I think I answered your second question. So let's go back to him. Well, it's sort of the same with improvisation. I mean, I think that you need to have that kind of knowledge. I think you need to, I think in order to improvise, it would be a good idea to learn about teaching approaches that have been theorized that are related to issues, understanding issues of culture and race and power in the classroom. Um, understanding what those frameworks are, seeing examples of how they play out in classrooms, and then having the opportunity to put some of those pieces in practice in your own lesson design and then uh, lesson delivery. That's off the top of my head what I would, I hope that's satisfactory. Hi. Hi. I have a question. I'm going to sit down because I just need to think through this question. Okay. Um, but I would love for you to just reflect on how you grapple with like the urgency of work of, of the work of uh, equipping and I'm thinking about practicing teachers with the skills to teach in socially just ways but also with the depth of uh, that requires and the time that requires um, I believe that there are specific things that teachers can learn how to do that work and there are organizations who are trying to make those resources like available in mass but I also agree with you that um, there is depth that's required to do that work, and the more of those resources are shared and shared and reiterated upon, that kind of cheapens it. But at the same time, we're facing these um, threats, like the teacher shortage and our failing education system and all those things. So I would just love for you to reflect on how you think about grappling with all of those challenges as you're thinking about you know, equipping teachers to do this work. Okay, so there's a lot that we ask teachers that we want them to know. And I'm trying to think of how I can ask this question without it sounding snarky. Because um, I don't mean it in a snarky way, but I think it'll come, it may come off that way. And I don't want to do that to all the thousands of people right, who are listening to me right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I can't see them. They're like, oh, that careful and brown, I see her at AERA. <laughs> snarky. OK, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question back at you. Do you think? that we do a good job of preparing teachers to do anything really well. No. So I think on some level, there's only certain things we're going to, first of all, they're not, teachers are not going out, coming out of a teacher ed program, an expert teacher. We wanna make sure that we're equipping them with a sort of foundation that will allow them a place to jump off from and to grow from. So, I think the way that I would answer your question is say, I don't think that we do a good, probably the best job of giving teachers everything we think that they need. But I think sociocultural issues 
often are the ones that get put to the side. Um, in one, on one level, it's because there, I mean, there's so much that needs to be taught. I mean, if you don't have, you know, I can teach a class and I can talk about race. And I have, a, I, I, you know, I teach the one class that our students and our pre-service program have to take. It's a foundations course before they get into their professional development sequence. I try to talk about race throughout the course, but if you look at my syllabus, you're gonna see two weeks devoted to race because there's so many things we have to talk about, right? And this is the only course really that they're required to take to deal with that issue. Now, if someone's not picking it up later, it's not going to get picked up. And I think what we have to do is see and recognize that this is really important work that there may need to be more foundational work that's done to prepare our students when they come into the teacher ed program. We need to find ways to integrate sociocultural knowledge as part of methods courses so that it's not something that's seen as separate and apart from the work that we're already doing. And then we need to be talking about sociocultural issues when we're in the field and we're watching our, our teachers engage in field work having them to use lenses to make sense of what they're seeing, how they're making sense of it, helping to bolster um, maybe events, processes that they aren't able to see um, because they don't have the lenses and we can help them to develop. Um, that's the best way that I can answer it. I mean, I do think that there's a lot we ask and we need to continue doing that work into induction. I mean, this doesn't need, this. just like any other field of study or any other disciplinary knowledge we expect teachers to learn and know and they continue to develop, they need to continue to develop in this work, this one. The problem is that too often it's seen as I took that course, I got that, I don't need to talk about it again. And that's where we have to sort of change, help to transform really how the teacher might be thinking about uh, what it means to be a teacher and what their role as a teacher is about because it is integrally connected to that That is your work. It's not just the class the one class that you then are done with Does that sort of get up? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Hi. Good Hi. Evening. Thank you so much for your beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, I was really appreciating in particular the last uh, the last couple slides where you quoted Dr. King and you know uh, reframed it using your experience in schools. I thought that was very powerful and um, you captured just attention that I feel on a regular basis. I'm on faculty here and oh. the chair of elementary teacher education okay. and we're trying to reform our program um, in many ways, we've been we've been making a lot of efforts to do a lot of the good work you're you're naming, uh, but definitely one major challenge that I, you captured in the last two lines, I think, of your talk, or that's the last two lines that I was really sitting with. We cannot wait for the system to change. We must be the change within the system. I I feel like I uh, grapple with those two statements every day in my in my heart you know um, some days I feel like we should just burn the system down to the ground and start over and that's what we should be doing in teacher education talking mm -hmm. about how to start over mm -hmm. um, and that happens to me you know almost every day when I hear about the, the atrocities that are happening in all schools um, but then I know that there's also very good work happening in, in places and and that it's not a reality. It just doesn't feel realistic. I, liter I really pause with that. I really wonder, like, should we just start over? Mm -hmm. Should we be training people to rebuild um, instead? Sometimes I wonder that. But um, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. But my question is, so if, if that wasn't where we go, if we were gonna s stick with what the system we have and figure out how to be the change within it. What skills do you think we need to be preparing beginning teachers with to do that? Because that's a very particular skill set. It's not just do what you think is right, but it's do what you know to be right 
within a system that is doing wrong okay. when you have very limited power mm -hmm. as a, and, and, and given the intersectional identities we all have, you know, we'll have different, different power, but as new teachers, our, our graduates don't have tremendous power in an unjust system. So what should I be, you know, what should be, as we, you know, we've talked about this with some of my colleagues right here in this room about developing a uh, vision that is, is about, you know, the, the goal, the final outcome would like, like a developmental trajectory. How do you work towards justice within such a system? But could we actually get people towards getting to a space, not where they're just working towards justice, but they're working to remake the system? Mm -hmm. That that would be like the ideal graduate. Um, what, what, would we, what would be the skills? Like how, what, what do you imagine we should be working on if we wanted someone to be able to graduate with that knowledge base? So thank you very much for your question. Um, and I can't even imagine, you know, or wrap my head around what that new system, how it would look. Um, I, my sense is that it would probably need to be, it wouldn't just be us figuring that out, it would be communities and families trying to figure out what, what, what would work. Uh, but I will say that I think helping teachers know that this, sh they should not go into it as lone wolves is the first component. I had the opportunity about seven years, six or seven years ago, to have a student in my class who was in the master's program. She was getting her teaching certification. And she, I didn't realize this at the time, but I later learned that she took a course that I, I, I was fairly new at the university, so it was longer than that. It must have been maybe 10 years ago. I had created this course, she took it, and it literally changed the way she thought about teaching. She had not thought about justice. That wasn't what, you know, she wasn't thinking about justice. She started teaching and decided she needed to work with other people. She, who are the other people that are talking about justice? And she went from being one person in one school to having a network of teachers, over 200 or more in the Austin area all of whom were committed to teaching for social justice. She ended up finding, it was really interesting, I um, had been in a program and had worked with a group of people about 20, almost 20 years ago. And one of the young men that I worked with was a teacher in Austin and I didn't know that and he ended up becoming a part of her, her network. Um, and they share, they support each, each other, they share. In some cases, when things come up in the city that they think are problematic for education or within their district, they find ways to, to collectively bring their voices together. And I know that there are, uh, there are people who have written about this, I think Bree Peacower has written about this and others related to teacher leadership and social justice. Um, I, I think the most important thing we can do is to help teachers realize that they can't do this alone, they shouldn't do it alone, that it can be hard to do it alone, and that you need to find your people. You need to find the people who you can connect with. It may also be bring, helping bring people along because that may happen as well. So not siloing yourself in your classroom um, because you will likely burn out. Um, sharing with them research that looks at how teacher networks work I think would be probably important, um, and maybe even helping them to, or helping them see or learn about different networks that are across the country and how they came to be. There's another, um, there's a book, and I'm not going to remember the, the title of it, I've used in my class by Jose Wilson, where he talks about that. I mean, reading that memoir, I had students read that memoir. Um, I think those are all really important things to do. I'm going to read a question from a dear friend and colleague of many of the people in the room, a graduate, a doctoral graduate of our program, Rebecca Gad, who wrote, it's so good to have her here on my phone, I have to say. She's been tweeting, she's like, she's just fantastic. And I don't know how to, I have Twitter and a I lot. don't even use it. I just, I need to learn, so I'm glad she's tweeting. <laughs> um, so she asks, over text, because I'm not so great with tweet, tip. Okay. 
that stuff too. Given that teachers do work within an unjust and oppressive system, how do you think about helping them learn to navigate structures that are designed to co-opt and undermine hmm. their ability to act as light bearers? For example, by overwhelming them with testing requirements, hmm. by denying them resources, et cetera, in ways that demand so much effort just to get through the day that doing anything more than the minimum can feel impossible. So it is true that I, I think teachers are asked to do an incredible amount of work now. <clears throat> At the same time, and I don't know what it's like here in Michigan, I also know that a lot of teacher autonomy around lesson making <clears throat> is somewhat diminished because there's a curriculum person that creates lessons, at least in many of the districts where I'm from. Um, and that person sort of works with teachers to help them um, bring those lessons to life. <clears throat> I think when a person has an orientation towards doing justice work and they have a knowledge base, I believe that in the context of the work you're being asked to do, it may end up being more, it will end up being more work, but how can you leverage what it is you're already doing with what it is you want to do and finding ways to make, to, to make that bridge. So it, it, just like we, we talk about helping students take knowledge that they bring with them to the classroom and bridging that to where you're trying to take them. Where I think a big difficulty comes is when the, there's a heavy load just to figure out how, just to figure out the knowledge you need in order to do the work. Like for me, you know, if I were to go back and teach, I'm not saying that I would be an excellent teacher. I don't know what I would do. I, I'm a former teacher, former fourth grade and eighth grade teacher. I don't know how I would teach in this, in this, in this time period. But what I do know is that there are certain frameworks I have. So when I see standards that I need to cover or a lesson I need to cover, I'm pretty sure that I would know how to do something, right? I would know how to maybe organize my students to learn in ways that aren't dehumanizing because I have a sense of how dehumanization works. The problem is you've got to go in with that knowledge. If you don't have that knowledge and you have to do the heavy lifting to get the knowledge and then apply the knowledge, that's why it's challenging. We need to do more of the foundational work. And then I think within the context of the decisions that you can make in the classroom, and teachers are still making decisions. They're still making judgments about children. There are still things that they're doing in that room. You will have a better sense of asking the question, why am I making this particular choice right now? Is there something else that I could do differently? I don't know if, that answer, if that's a satisfactory answer, but I do believe that, the, that, that one of the reasons why it seems like so much work is because we're still playing catch up to learn how to do the work in the first place. Hello, thank Hi. you uh, for coming to our campus and chatting thank you for with the us. invitation. Um, back to um, your comment on a student you had who formed kind of this like network in Austin. Um, I'm curious about like replicating that at the smaller level of like an actual individual school mm -hmm. and to quote you and dr anthony brown would it be useful or dangerous to like form a committee for this work in a school because um, as someone who's very passionate about it it's hard to enter a school where these ideas aren't necessarily even thought of or mm -hmm. considered and then as a young person new to the field and returning to the field after my graduate program i have these ideas of like oh maybe if i formed a committee but it I fear a committee might create superficial efforts. So just curious on your take on something like that. Thank you. So th thank you, and thank you for bringing up that article. I remember that one. <laughs> um, I think you have to know your, 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 your school community. <clears throat> um, if you have the space to actually create such a such a group or organization and it's not going to be something that will put you and your colleagues work at risk you know um, if the school is you know suggesting that you do that I think you should I think that you are right to think about some of the uh, potential um, 
ways that the group may, the work may get co-opted, but that, that's what happens. Anytime something becomes institutionalized, it's institutionalized, right? The, but it's, it's sort of a double bind because without the institutionalization, there then are no, that you don't have something that you can hang your hat on. So what I would say is to create the organization, if you can create it, know what it is you all are wanting, get buy-in from those who have the power to allocate resources and time, that can make decisions that you may need made to, to, to put some of the things in place that you, that you work on, and then when the co-opting starts, you all are already prepared because you know what happens and how discourses of diversity can become superficial. And you have something you can, you can say, but, but, the, but we started this. We were expected to start this so that we could make real change. I think you'll need to become savvy if you're not. Spend time maybe um, thinking about what are the ways that this could get watered down and making sure that you're not letting that happen. What I found is that it's sort of hard sometimes to hold a person's feet to the fire if you don't have, if you don't even have a commitment. So here you have a commitment. You've got to think about like this, there's a commitment. Now, how are we going to make sure that when when, when something happens, we're able, we're able to say, well, you know, you have this commitment, but what's happening right now is you're wa we're watering this down. Um, and, you'll, and you'll be able to maybe call on the fact that everyone said that they wanted to have this group, right? Um, that is how, at least in some of the, I've, I've had the opportunity to be a part of some of those same kinds of communities, and I found that staying vigilant when things start going awry or people start talking about things or they're talking about it in a superficial way, respectfully, thoughtfully calling attention to that um, and not taking your foot off the pedal <laughs> will be important. So yes, I would say have that, that space if you can have it and it's not going to be an antagonism up front. Otherwise, you can just have your own group and meet outside the group and try to help each other and support each other. Thanks. Right, come on. Um, thank you for the, the talk. And I, I mm -hmm. wanted to go back. You, you talked about um, uh, becoming a light bearer. And you had that slide with the four elements. Um, mm -hmm being a lifelong learner and um, uh, the, the piece around social, uh, social cultural knowledge. And then um, you had this thing, the third one was about, about uh, searching for goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wondered about, so the two, and then the last one is the uh, acknowledging the power of, the, of uh, teaching. And there are two questions that I have. One is whether you would be comfortable with generalizing that framework Oh. out of the context of teacher education. Um, okay. It starts with becoming a light bearer. Uh, mm. So to be a light bearer in our society, um, would those be four elements that you might uh -huh. consider? Uh, I, the, I mm. am struck by the ways in which um, uh, working with people around white privilege um, and uh, growing the social cultural knowledge which is needed people want to jump into becoming an ally and they they're not in a position to do it and so uh, I'm, I'm struck by that and I the 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 searching for the good um, I, uh, I mean the lifelong learning as well I mean some people start when I mean, we start to I you know I start to learn about these things but then it's an ongoing process, yeah. and that's that just needs to continue. It's not you get someplace and then you decide, okay, now I can go do this work or something. Mm -hmm. You have to continue that. So I'm struck by the, the sort of more general application. That's the first question, mm -hmm. whether that's a comfortable sort of move. I've um, never even thought about it, but as you were talking, I was like, we probably we do need more light bears in our society, right? We do. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, um, I'm struck by the searching for um, the good. I, I. Th what I heard in that a little bit was your reference back to Du Bois' um, uh, work and the ways in which, and I, 
so searching for the good makes a lot of sense to me. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, but there's another piece that I keep thinking is significant and thought I was hearing in your discussion about Du Bois that he wasn't, I mean, searching for the good maybe characterizes it fully enough. But another way to think about that is, is about spotting narratives that exist in the, in the culture that need to be countered mm -hmm. and very deliberately uh, designing <laughs> the stories of good mm -hmm. to counter those narratives. And so I wonder to what extent um, that third thing might be, whether there's a, a sort of integration of thinking more about strategic work. I mean, I think mm. that there's a general sort of orientation of searching for the good, and the word searching helps with that. But then I, I wonder about this other piece about strategically um, designing counter narratives or designing yeah. stories that help people uh, do things differently in the world. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to think about that, and I'll, I'll tell you what I was thinking about when I put when I use those examples. And, and, and there's some beautiful work that has just been published recently about the black exposition at uh, the black exhibit at the Paris Exposition, and it's phenomenal. I mean, it's it's deep, it's deep, and it goes much deeper than what I've presented here. Um, on one level. I think we need to search for the good, not as a way to try to convince people of our goodness. Um, I do think at the turn of the 20th century, there was an impetus to do that work. Like when we think about racial uplift narratives. Um, and I think maybe that there was this optimism that by somehow showing these counter stories, you could convince the larger dominant society that black people, in this case, they're okay, they're smart, they're capable. By and large, that I don't think that that necessarily worked in that way. I want, and I want to be careful saying that. Um, I think we needed the counter story. In some ways, I think about the power of the counter story for the group itself. To have a counter to what they're getting assaulted with. So in saying that, when I talk about in search of the good, it's about, and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm drawing from uh, Lawrence Lightfoot, in some cases even drawing from Gloria Latson Billings' work with dream keepers and culturally relevant pedagogy, that we're gonna look like our orientation when we're working with young people or children shouldn't always be about what they don't have and what they need. Now, at one level, I, I mean, I definitely think that's racialized. I think it's racialized and it's gendered and classed. But on another level, I think it's just about how people think about what it means to be a teacher. Like, my job is to help you learn what you don't know. And so when we reorient, in some ways, what I'm, I'm saying is not only reorienting that, that narrative, that dominant narrative, that's racialized and gendered and classed that you're bringing in, but it's also reorienting what your role is as a teacher. And it should be about figuring out what your kids actually know, because there's something really powerful from figuring out what they know as you're going to bridge to what they, what they may not know. And, at the, and, and I think a byproduct of that is that you look at that student as a much more, in a much more holistic way. So in saying that, I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if anyone's done any research on the impact of the black exhibit on actually changing perceptions and perspectives. Um, but I use that example because I, I, I thought of it as a person who was taking something that was dark and finding a way to reframe it um, at that time period. And I think that that's what looking for the goodness in the classroom will do for us too and possibly in the world where we try our best to see the good or those places where we can pull on the good and do something um, justice oriented with it I don't know if I address I think I might have addressed your your point but I'm not I, I'm, is there anything else that did I get at it what did I get at your question Yes, I, I, in generalizing it outside of just preparing people to become teachers or to think about it as just an orientation that people might have in the world, I, I think that 
in most things in life, we need to be constant learners. We need to be open. We need to be willing. I could have added humility to that as well, but being an open, open indicates that I don't know everything um, and seeking the good. I, th I think it's that, it, it, I think it could work. Yes. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. I didn't think about it like that. Any other? Thank you very much for your talk. You. Sometimes the magnitude, magnitude of the darkness and the size of the challenge is hopeless. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, how do you keep your own light shining? Oh. <coughs> Probably the, the thing that, that encourages me the most is that I know that I'm not the only person, right? So like I don't have, I realize that I'm just this little bitty speck in a world with other people who are going through things that are experiencing life. I know that there are people who came before me who experienced conditions that I could never even imagine going through. Um, and I think that it's that legacy that fuels me. At the same time, I do get, I mean, I, I, there are times when it can be overwhelming. And I'm going to tell you when it has become the most overwhelming for me. And I think probably everyone in this room who has children can agree. There are times when I am teaching about something in my classes. And I am experiencing that exact thing with my own children. I have been teaching about um, stereotypes and the over-disciplining of children of color. And I have gotten a phone call in the middle of class from my child's school. And they're telling me something that reminds me of what we're teaching about, what I'm teaching about. Um, so I think it can get, I don't want to give the impression that it's not tough, it is. But I, I personally chose to become a teacher um, initially because I really wanted to try and make a difference. And that has carried me through to where I am now. So when I do get down or um, it's tough, I take a moment. Sometimes I need to take a lot of moments. I need to read when I get stressed, I read a lot of things that I have nothing to do with my work. Um, and I try to get myself recentered. And I realize that it's not, I don't have to carry the world on my shoulders. I'm not the only one that's doing this, that I just need to do my part. And that will be enough for me to do my part. Well, thank you. Like sort of a perfect moment to to thank you for all that you've given us and you know I was thinking as you were answering this beautiful last question about how like the tracks of what you just said are actually all over your talk mm -hmm. there were so many moments throughout your talk where you linked us with each other where you you know offered hope to teachers um, in systems to connect with each other and the power of that to remake themselves as systems to be connected and mm -hmm. I hear what you just said is linking you to us over mm -hmm. time which is in many ways what we hope to do in the seminar series mm -hmm. which is to, to think together about this really big problem and not be alone with it mm -hmm. um, so I'm so grateful for the generosity of everything that you gave to us and all that you taught us thank you so much um, I think everybody here and, and out there feels precisely the same things that I'm saying. Um, we'll keep all of these ideas alive. Yeah. We will continue to talk and think, and I know that you have a working paper coming, so we'll have yeah. that as another resource and asset for our learning. Um, and we're, we will come back in the earliest days of spring. I'm so excited to say those words. I think yes. it's 52 days yes. until spring for us. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I count them. So yeah. on March 23rd, we'll be joined by um, Dr. Valerie Kinlock, who will be the final speaker in this year's series. Um, everybody, please help me in thanking our amazing speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.